we're seeing that personal pages are getting more reach and engagement than company pages. And so yeah. it's possible that your CMO or your CTO, you know, all these different people within your organization are no longer behind the scenes, but are going to also be representing either online or offline. I've done startups my entire career. And one of the things everybody sells in this company, mm -hmm. not just the sales team, not just the marketing team, like you can be in finance, you're in sales. Yes. That means you, we need to know who we're targeting. And if everyone knows it, like you don't know who, especially in the Bay Area, your neighbor might be the ideal customer. Yeah. You know, the, the people at the daycare that your kids play with, ideal customers. And you're just hanging out. You're like going to T-ball with them. And you're like, what do you do? And you're like, oh, apparently I make a thing specifically for you. We're not going to talk shop. <laughs> but it's just, you know, it's like a natural conversation. Yeah. It's, it's, well, it's a, amazing to me how it's such a missed opportunity. Like I've, I've go to a lot of events. So many people will even just stick to their little teams, you know, like when they go to a dinner and it'll just be the, yeah. their little pod sitting together. And there are just so many opportunities in our daily lives to connect with people that could be a business opportunity in one capacity or another. And then of course, on top of that, we have the rise of the personal brand being a very integral part of marketing organizations of all sizes. We're seeing that personal pages are getting more reach and engagement than company pages. And so yeah. it's possible that your CMO or your CTO, you know, all these different people within your organization are no longer behind the scenes but are going to also be representing either online or offline. And if they're not given the information that they need to understand and have that crystal clear image of who they're communicating with, then you don't have that cohesive, clear North Star, as you named it, to really drive all of the decision-making that's happening. So I have family that is like, global leaders in uh, wholesale e-commerce. And I was actually wanting to ask you this because your focus is e-commerce. So I was sharing with my godmother, I was like, hey, like in the B2B space, B2B tech space, especially in the last couple of years, it's been topsy-turvy. You know, a lot of go-to-market teams have gotten restructured and just changed around and focuses have changed. And it hasn't been as much, let's get in some shiny objects. It's been make do with what you have and really maximize your value out of it, mm -hmm. right? Make sure you clean up your fundamentals. We're not gonna, we don't have the budget to spend as many things anymore. She said that's kind of in the e-commerce space as well a little bit. I don't know fully. I think you see a million oh, no, she's more. Spot on. Than I do. So walk me through that. Like, what is it like right now for marketing? Like if I'm diving in, because there are a lot of tech companies targeting e-commerce companies. So if we learn how, you know, what's happening on both sides, it might help. Yeah, so the e-commerce space, I think, mirrors a lot of other industries where there was a lot of money that flooded in after the initial deep breath of COVID. So once it became clear that e-commerce obviously was going to be very uh, much a winner, at least in the short term with the pandemic, there started to be a, a big infusion of capital and all of these different aggregators popped up who were buying very overvalued Amazon businesses and e-commerce businesses. And all of the tech companies were just going all out and totally ridiculous with everything that they were doing. And I would say then about a year and a half to two years ago, that really started to quiet down. And yeah. there was consolidation, there was bankruptcies, there were companies that were purchased for evaluation that were then destroyed mm -hmm. because these aggregators didn't really know how to operate it. And so the financing isn't there anymore. Those big exit opportunities have disappeared and sort of dissipated. And so I think that's psychologically really affected a lot of e-commerce businesses. But then on top of that, you have all of the changes 
with the way that meta advertising works. So it's much more expensive and more complicated to get the traffic than it was in the past. Other costs are much higher. And so between not being able to get the financing and the capital that you need, not having that exit opportunity that once was, and just maintaining a profitable business in the here and now, it has definitely created a much more conservative ecosystem than what it was even just a couple of years ago. So how are teams like navigating through that? It's, that's a great question. I, I mean, I think it, doubling down on content is really one of the main things that I'm seeing. So there was a big push for lots of events and obviously big budgets come along with those. I'm seeing way less of that, way fewer events and minimal presence at events, you know, smaller teams that are going, no grand parties like there were previously. And the other thing that's happened specifically in e-com that's a little bit different is it used to be something where for, you know, five or $10,000 you and not a lot of experience, you could build mm -hmm. a multi-million dollar company. And it's just less and less that way now. You need more startup capital. You have so much more that you need to manage and figure out between these different pl platforms like TikTok and Amazon and Shopify. And so there's a lot more sophistication that the person that's going to be successful in e-commerce today needs a stronger skill set. And that's also something that's changed the whole space I would say is growing up a little bit. Yeah. It's kind of grown up with the social media, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's funny because like 10 years ago, social media roles were kind of junior roles, mm -hmm. right? And then just kind of spin them up, throw a post up, whatever. Now the expectations, everyone understands social media for the most part, but now there's more tools. And so you can get really like deep understanding analytics, even like what makes people tick? So why aren't you making it tick, them tick more, right? Your boss can ask you that or whatever. Yes. So we're seeing kind of, social media people and e-commerce companies grow and kind of have that ability to, you know, get more resources, but also get more responsibility. Guys, it was a great conversation. It went in a lot of different directions, but ultimately it ended up where we wanted to go, you know, which is like benefiting B2B marketers and B2C marketers, really just marketers as a whole. When you're launching a product, there's obviously always going to be nuances, but it's, it's having your core values, core mission. What are we going to focus on? It's like, we better have something good to deliver first off. And then, yeah, doubling and tripling down, make sure stay in our lane if we're focusing on a vertical and don't be afraid to do a profile and have an avatar. <laughs> on the note of personal brand, I think like everyone has to work on it and maybe I need to reevaluate mine because mine has lately just been complaining about weather and SPF. Oh, well, I, the beginning of our conversation today was very <laughs> on brand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's just stay that way, but yeah. SPF daily is very important. I finally found one that my husband begrudgingly agrees to wear most days. You know, it's for the health <laughs> and wellness of our skin. <laughs>